The language of the soul is music. Come with us and discover the many ways that music enters our lives on The Spirit of Radio. Now on Sunday nights from 10 to midnight, right here on the all-new Hazy Radio. Don't get left behind. And we're back. You are listening to the Hazy Radio Network. I am Raven Waitson. I'm here with Rob Waitson and Grandpa Peter Coyote. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, since it is Christmas, um, we are not really uh, big fans of Christmas. We tend to celebrate Yule and the Winter Solstice on the 21st. Um, what's your take on Christmas? My take? Yeah. What, what do you do? What do you feel about it? Oh, I just, in fact, I'm just uploading a Christmas story today. Now, I don't particularly, you know, follow all of the uh, legends about the holiday, but it's always been a special time of year for me, the solstice, Christmas, New Year's, that general time frame. And, of course, I feel a real connection with that life whose uh, birth we celebrate in this holiday. Of course, anybody in the realm would, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? But... He's just another one of us. It's yep. no, you know, we've we've over glamorized uh, many beings. You know, historically, he's one of them. But at the same time, because he was a she, and they changed the story around crazily. So I don't agree with the the religious aspects of it, obviously. But yeah, Christmas has always been an amazing time of change for me. I mean, that general time frame, but Christmas Day always seems to have a little special magic. Christmas Eve seems to have a little more, but it always. I just told the story today, and I guess I can give it briefly here. I don't. I hate to ruin my video, but oh well. Uh, it, it was like I was I was stuck in Portland, Oregon. I was, you know, I've been a trucker a good share of my life, but I've done a lot of other things. I've run some businesses when I was young. I was in the uh, theater business to begin with, then moved over into the film business for a while. And when I was 21, I was the number two man in a movie company, you know. <laughs> I'd done some things in my time, but, you know, the time I'm 23, I'm back to driving truck because that's what I like to do. I couldn't stand the corporate world and the business world and all the shenanigans that you had to play to, to be a player there. I just didn't have the uh, grit in that area to do it I couldn't just put my heart away and pretend it didn't matter because it always mattered to Mm -hmm. me always you know so that's why I wound up back driving truck but I'd get off every now and then I'd do that for a few years and I'd go start a little business and this was one of those years where I'd done I I started a little marketing company with a friend of mine with the idea of promoting small business through uh, direct mail coupons and we tried a project lasted six months and didn't make us any money but sure made us work a lot had a lot of fun but I made some connections. So when we decided that that project wasn't worthy of our effort, I just went off and formed it. Just took my little marketing company and, and some of the connections I had and started selling little novelty items, mostly to gift shops and convenience stores, things like that. And one thing led to another. And, you know, I, I made a living doing that kind of thing. I'd have to work all up and down the West Coast to do it, but I worked a beautiful territory. You couldn't beat it. So one Christmas, you know, I'm working, I always work gift shows in the fall to uh, help with the income, to help cover expenses in the winter. You know, you can make a substantial amount of money over a weekend of a, a gift show. And there's a big one in Portland, Oregon, uh, the Christmas gift show. I asked two weekends in a row for three days. So I worked those. And it was like a recession year. I think it was right about the beginning of the first Iraqi war. And people were a little bit depressed and down. and So I only made about half the money I needed to make. So I wound up, uh, this fella came by and left his card. He looked just like Satan. He wore <laughs> red, point, red pointy toe shoes. He had the thin little mustache. He had his eyebrows trimmed just right, you know. He wore the, the great big old uh, trench coat and the fedora hat. And he had the nice little perfect blonde bimbo under his arm, and sometimes two of them, you know. <laughs> and he rode around in an old Lincoln town car with smoked out, dark blue Lincoln town car with smoked out windows. Quite the character. But anyway, you know, I'm not a judgmental person. I mean, shoot his business, you know. So he told me he had this little uh, gift show going in a mall out there in southeast Portland, and they were doing a fair amount of business there. If I wanted to come over and work, he'd uh, rent me a booth for, you know, whatever. So I wound up going over there, 
because I needed to make up some income. And I spent another 30 days staying in Portland. And mostly I was staying in my van at night because I couldn't afford a motel room at the time because it ate up all the money I made in a day. It was that slow of the year. <laughs> but I made sufficient by the time Christmas Eve come that I did have a little money in my pocket. And one thing led to another ice storm started happening about two, three hours before we closed up our little show. So by the time I'm done and got my little van all packed up and ready to leave, the doggone uh, ice has gotten so bad the streets are undrivable. People are sliding into each other all over the place. It's about 6 o'clock in the evening, Christmas Eve, and there's wrecks and accidents everywhere. Uh, about two inches of ice on the ground already and on the trees and the fences and everything. So I just pulled into this motel across from this mall where we'd been working and uh, got me a room, you know. Mm -hmm. And holy cow, I went through an experience that night because of that, that, you know, I'd been going through some uptight things in the 80s and, you know, you backpedal, you learn a lot. You, you let it, leave a challenging, lead a challenging life when you're a searcher like I am, you know, and you never leave a stone unturned hardly. And so you go through a lot. So, you know, I'd been there, done that a bunch, you know, but I'd gotten kind of uptight in the 80s because of some strange practices I'd got into. I was in the process of freeing up a little here, a little there. And that night, you know, because the only thing in town open was this uh, topless bar up the street, I go there and I wound up having an experience with this dancer uh, lady that just... I mean, it was magic. And it was because there wasn't a bunch of drunk guys hanging around and mucking up the energy and everything. There was something really pure and, and sweet that happened between us. No touching, nothing like that. It was just a, a mystical thing. But, oh, it was deep, personal. It was beautiful. And it brought me back out of my uh, inner shell. Started started cracking that thing wide open. It was amazing. And then I go back to my motel room alone, but I was feeling, you know, very satisfied, very happy, very pleased to be alive again. You know what I mean? I was starting to feel my life come back. It was awesome. <laughs> and uh, the next morning, man, there's like six inches of ice on everything out there. And as the sun's coming up, my room is covered in... Uh, prismatic rainbows, just all kinds of them. It's like somebody's got one of the, some, a whole bunch of those little uh, crystals outside there and refracting the sun into rainbows. My room was filled with soft rainbows everywhere you looked, all over my body, all over my sheets, everywhere. It was, just, it was incredible. Stayed that way for like, oh hell, 20 minutes, something like that as the sun came up. It was just incredible, man. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. I felt like I was bathed in rainbows that morning. Wow. And then I go down, you know, because now I'm all filled in with energy and charged like a mother. And so what do I do? So I go down to the mo motel lobby and hang out and drink coffee. And people start assembling there. And pretty soon there's a pretty large crowd. And we get to, a, you know, I'm kind of a chatterbox uh, in a way. But in another way, uh, I'm able to help people open up. And they do that with me a lot. So we had a really, really good conversation going on in the lot for Christmas morning. Of course, we're all feeling a little sentimental. We're all away from home, whatever that is. And, you know, so we have a, a connection. And, and it gets real personal, real beautiful, you know. And, and there was some real sharing going on there. And then this one guy, about 10 o'clock in the morning, he just happened to be working over at the same little gift show I was. But he'd had a, a really good sell. He was selling a book or something. He'd had some real success. And uh, so he offered to take everybody out to uh, Christmas dinner. We found out there's a restaurant three miles away. There's a train that's running that'll get us there. So all of us, there's about 25, 30 of us, trekked over to that train, you know, being careful not to slip on the ice. It was treacherous. And got there and had Christmas dinner at this Lions Cafe in Portland, and it was just like it was like closer to family than any family I'd ever known. You know, it was, uh, it was like uh, having dinner with your real family, the real family you never met, never knew, and all of a sudden here they all there are are all there and sitting down enjoying life with you. You know, it was it was an amazing experience. You know, and uh, just one hell of a weekend. Every Christmas for me. 
something of that nature goes on. This one, you know, I'm going through uh, some very deep personal reprogramming. I'm seeing subconscious judgments that I make instantaneously on people and how I categorize them and box them up and deal with them from that basis from there on. You know, it's not a good thing. I know we're all programmed, but I'm being able to see the subconscious functioning of that. And because I can see that, then I'm able to unravel it and deal with people less judgmentally, you know. And uh, in the process, give up a little more of my pain. Whenever we're pissy with each other, or ornery, or angry, it's because we're in pain. We may or may not be aware of it, but it's because we're in pain. That's why people, you take the east coast of this country where things are pretty harsh there, you know. People are pretty rough with one another. Just go over there and feel it sometime. You'd be amazed. The pain is almost overwhelming. I can hardly be there for just a few minutes, let alone a few days, just because it's so intense in those areas, you know. <laughs> I can uh, fully appreciate what you're saying there. Um, I'm... Um hypersensitive um, and empathic so like you I pick yeah. up on these energies and for a few hours today I was really really struggling because I could just feel the sadness out there um, because yeah. you know Christmas always brings sadness and yeah. um, I you know kind of consciously said I don't want to feel the sadness I want to feel the happiness of people around because the sadness it was just too overwhelming yeah, that's what I've been feeling is the happiness, and I've been promoting that from here. I, you know, I did a little one-hour video show this morning on YouTube, snuck it in on them. I just happened <laughs> to get equipped on Christmas Day so I could do it, so I had to try it out, and it worked beautifully. But that's what I've been doing all day. Is like, uh, and I think I do that every Christmas too. I think I, I uh, pull all that energy into myself amp it up and, and send it back out again. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I told somebody the other day I'm getting to be like a little ball of energy that things are affecting me less and less because everything that's thrown at me just goes into that little ball of energy and becomes love, you know, and then I can creatively use it for anything I want. It's kind of almost like insulation in a way. You know, but it's something that's just developing. I mean, I know I've had this for a while, too, in another way, in another level. Otherwise, I wouldn't be alive speaking about it. But uh, because of that, now I can do that. You know, I'm learning a lot. And this is what I'll be sharing more and more of on YouTube is the practical, and Facebook, too, the practical ways that this occurs how the trend how the that's what i call myself as a videographer on youtube and i'm like just coaching us all through it i'm going through it right along with everyone else or those that are sensitive we're all going through that because we're the door openers and the gatekeepers mm -hmm. and that's what we do people like you and i and others that have this sensitivity that's what we're here for not everybody even understands that so i'm even helping people get that <laughs> you know it's just what we do here, but yeah, it's, you know, when I hit 65, and that was a year, a little over a year ago, uh, I knew an amazing miracle had occurred, and that from then on, there would be no problems getting ascension to happen. You know what I mean? I just knew that I had finally fulfilled my contract, whatever that was, as a personality, but of course, it's just my function as a greater part of the whole, too, so... <laughs> I, c can I just ask a question? Please, yeah. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on... Uh, obviously, we're here um, anchoring the energy and birthing the new earth. Um, yeah. What do you see... When people say to you th the words new earth, what do you envision? What do you see? Well, I've gone to this place before, and it's very similar in appearance to what we live in here, but it's not the same. And what it is, it's like uh, a happy dance of life going on continually amongst the people that live in this place, the animals and the trees and the birds and the bees. Everybody is so in love with everything that it can't help but grow and be happy and just do the best it can to shine and just 
love Lord and Miller. It's it's a I compare it. I don't know if you remember an old cartoon uh, that Walt Disney did about Uncle Remus, you know, and he got to this place where there's a bluebird on his shoulder and it's a zippity doo dah day. Well, that's the place I kind of see it like. It's just I've had experiences in this life. Uh, I remember one in particular. It was the morning of an eclipse. Spirits had this when I was living down in Boulder, and I was pretty much homeless and just living at the behest of the universe. And they asked me if I wouldn't go up on this one mountain one night on the evening of an eclipse. Eclipse is going to happen in the morning and spend the night there. And of course I did. And of course it was an amazing and awesome experience. And in the morning when I'm coming down for that, I want to get down to this place where I can see. There's lots of trees up there. And I want to get down to this place where I can see uh, just in case the eclipse is visible in the sunrise, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm walking down that way. And the animals all came out of the woods and were walking right alongside of me. Birds were flying with me. I didn't have one land on my shoulder, but they might as well have. It felt like, I mean, there was raccoons, there was rabbits, there was deer. Uh, I don't know what all else was there, but just everything, all the animals and stuff. And I just felt so high and happy. I felt like I lived in paradise. And we were all in communion. We had this, it wasn't like words. But like this feeling, this bonding, you know. Mm -hmm. And as we walked down, it was kind of like leading a sacred procession off the mountain or something, you know. Mm -hmm. It's almost like that. Not really leading it, being a part of it. Let's put it that way. God, Sounds it was good. awesome. Mm. So that's what I see the new world to be, is something like that, where everybody is uh, very, con I mean, closely and intimately connected with every other life around it, you know, within it and all about it. I mean, you know, it's a completely conscious place of being where we finally accept the love that we are and begin to actively create from that basis rather than blindly create through little moments of joy that we manage to sneak in here somehow when nobody's looking. <laughs> <laughs> Complete change of circumstances, but essentially the same place. This, what I see happening as we gain the consciousness, these things that seem so fixed and real to us just dissolve right before our very eyes. It's it's kind of like we've been trained not to see what's truthfully there. Have you ever noticed that when you get used, like there's a, a say you go down a familiar street all the time, something changes on that street, but your eyes won't see it takes you a little time for your eyes to adjust and to see the new building or the different garbage can that's there or whatever it was that changed, you know. Yeah, I know it's, it's a strange phenomenon, but that's humanity. That's where we've been as a, in a greater sense. And so it's just a matter of letting ourselves uh, understand what we truthfully see here. Because I think we already live in that world. We just don't know it. We've been trained to see it otherwise and to deal with it as something that's our enemy and not our friend. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, um, I was going to ask you. I, I have this this thing I can do with people where I, I separate the body from the spirit, if you like, just like I can separate a driver of a car from the vehicle that it's in. Um, yeah. And not a lot of people understand that one. So, which one do you think is being fooled, the driver or the car? Well, neither, because even though they appear as separate vehicles, one's an extension of the other, so they're both one and the same. It's just felt differently, because on this human level, uh, the divine is not so intense. You know, we've been taught to avoid that uh, side of ourselves, the divine side, and to actually think of our uh, ourselves as humble and powerless beings. You know, it's part of the experience here. It's part of the aloneness that we've chosen to experience here but I don't see any separation I see like spirit and I see like soul as an interrogatory being and I see the body as a housing for the interrogatory soul but I also see all three of them joined together as one person one being you see so I think it's just a matter of you know right now we're living on the on the low end of the spectrum in the density on the dense side of it but you know there's a whole bunch of simultaneous life going on with us and through us that's actually active inside of us constantly that's what we're acting on even though we think we're doing all these personal choices <laughs> but anyway 
and it's all simultaneous. It's like stacked on top of each other. So you're having several experiences at one time on many different levels in many different ways. And consciousness is just living all of that experience in one mind, in one heart, in one moment, and on all those levels at once, because there really is no level. There's only one life being lived. And it's a matter of experiencing the truth of that life, because obviously we've been separated from it, or we wouldn't be struggling. <laughs> it is, it's nice to actually get to this point and not feel um, so alien in the skin anymore. I know yeah. um, as, as a child, being empathic and psychic, really knowing and feeling different um, and just not fitting in or belonging anywhere... Oh, um, and having all, and having all those uh, reservations because you have past life memories or yeah. energies in, in your body <laughs> yep. where you've been, you know, killed for that stuff mm -hmm. before. You know? Yep. <laughs> yeah, and now it's just these last few years really being able to connect with other people that understand, and just knowing that it's okay to kind of step out the closet now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's an yeah. awesome thing, man. It really is. That's, I'm going through a very similar thing. I'm finally getting happy in my little body, you know. It's mm -hmm. like, gee, it's amazing. It's an amazing process. See, I think we're all, you know, despite all of our seeming differences, I think we're really basically all of us dealing with it at the same level at the same time, each in our own particular way and aspect of it, but all of us going through the same essential experience at the same time. Don't you think? Yep. Sure looks that way to me, I tell you. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are really um, going through this ascension process and they're just oblivious to it. Um, they just don't understand what's happening to them. Yeah. Um, which is difficult because um, they know things are changing, they know things are different, but they can't put it into words and they can't really understand it. Um, yeah, so they get tense and start beating on each other and stuff, you know, yelling at each other and and uh, trying trying harder to make it work. But you know, it's not a bad thing. The more they push that way, the more the outcome is assured because it'd be like winding up a spring, and you're only going to get it so tight before it unwinds, mm -hmm. <laughs> it breaks, you know. Yeah, um, I mean. As, as people are waking up and um, experiencing the ascension process, they're also purging, like all their their crap, their repressed energies, their anger, just it overflows because they don't know what's happening. And this is why people are fighting and angry and um, just kicking off all the time. I know yeah. people... Um, well, a lot of people in the uh, spiritual community, um, you know, are saying that a lot, a lot of this isn't happening. Uh, they're almost blinkered to it. But if you actually look out there, you can see it happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I went to our little town. I live about nine miles out of town. And now our little town is not very big. It's a post office, a few restaurants, you know, things like that. Not very much there. But I couldn't even hardly stay there because the energy was so tweaky yesterday mm -hmm. afternoon because everybody was tense over something going on Christmas Eve. I don't even know what it was. Mm -hmm. but and were, I mean, I'm, I'm running people that weren't in that field, but boy, there was sure a lot of tension. I had to do, I just did my business, picked up my things, and hitchhiked out of town quick. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what we're like here. I mean, we, we live in, um, in, in Devon in the UK. We're pretty much uh, out in the sticks. It's just a little town here. We kind of just yeah. head on into town, grab what we can, and then rush back just so we don't have to uh, mix with that energy. Yeah, if it's not on the yeah. list, we don't buy it. Yeah, yeah it, you know, it is difficult being so sensitive to just people that, you know, their thoughts, yeah. their feelings, the, the atmosphere, just everything, really. It's, um, yeah, it is, it is. And there's times I, I can't stand to be in it, and there's other times I have to dive in. Uh, full on, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. and just go be it because I'm there to uh, help change the energy. So some, uh, so I've been equipped to be able to handle those kind of feelings. I did, I just don't find them real pleasant. I don't like mm -hmm. to deal with them when I'm around them too much. You know this what is I mean? it exactly. Yeah. I mean, we're here to kind of hold the light, anchor the light, and activate the people around us and, and wake yeah. them up. Um, you know, so there is a point where you have to think, okay, I can't just keep hiding. I've got to step out. Got to do something. Um, 
I mean, because we're actually on air, um, we're able to affect people uh, just through our voices, um, yeah. which is good because that also uh, wakes them up. They feel our energy. Um, but that is my main way of communicating with people now because just being so sensitive, it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah. That's what I do... Uh uh, a lot of work on the computer just for that same reason but mm -hmm. well it's not just that it's because I can reach such a vast audience here yep. uh, sitting in my kitchen table it's an amazing time to be alive just because of that <laughs> <laughs> ok so we're top of the hour and we have to take a break again yep, we're going to take four and a half minutes and we'll be back and get his computer to do as it's told ok there we go push your buttons Rob 